Well, good evening and welcome to our second series, second uh, part in our series on righteousness by faith in the books of Romans, Hebrews, James, and Revelation. I hope that you are enjoying the camp meeting here in Durango, Colorado. It's a thrill to be in the mountains and to meet with God, isn't it? And it's, I don't know, there's something special about going up on the mountain. And um, I know that you have had some happy occasions visiting and seeing the sights and the grandeur of the Rocky Mountains. You know, as, I, as Shirley and I were driving here to Durango, and as we were watching and looking at the mountains as we drove by, I concluded that there would be no other appropriate name than Rocky Mountains. <laughs> I've never seen so many rocks in all my life. <laughs> Big ones. <laughs> well, tonight we're going to continue in our study. We have been examining a number of things that um, are near and dear to our hearts. And tonight I'm going to begin my presentation with a question that uh, I want you to consider. I want to go to a, a text in the Bible Galatians 3, verses 28 and 29. You perhaps have read this verse a thousand times. Okay, so I exaggerate. You've read this verse many times. And I want to read it one more time and then ask you a question. Let's notice what it says. Galatians 3, 28 says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, Gentile, Slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Christ has brought an end to distinctions among human beings. In Christ, we are one. There is neither Jew there is neither Gentile. Now notice the next verse. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now let me ask you a, a very important question. Why would any Christian want to be an heir of Abraham. What's the big deal here? What is the promise? What was promised to Abraham? And if I understand this correctly, it indicates to me that if I am in Jesus, that I am actually an heir of all that was promised to Abraham. The word seed here, you are Abraham's seed, in the Greek this word here is sperma, from which we get the word sperm. This is the origin of life. You are Abraham's offspring. God reckons you as a son or daughter of Abraham. Why would I want to be an offspring of Abraham? <laughs> Is that a fair question? Now, many Christians today are totally confused about the distinction between Jew and Gentile. And in fact, there's an entire eschatology of end time events built around one series of events for Christians and another for Jews. Have you heard about those? Sure. And it's amazing that this kind of construct, theological or eschatological construct, gets put forward when the Bible clearly says in plain Greek <laughs> that in Christ there is no, I repeat, N-O, no distinction. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave or free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. Now, 
What is it that was promised to Abraham long ago that is so important that I would want to be an heir of Abraham? What, has the, what, what is coming to Abraham that I would want part of? No? <laughs> well, hold your fire. Let's go to the Bible. Uh, we're going we're gonna to pick up, we're going to go to um, Genesis 11, verse 1. Now, Genesis 11, verse 1, is where we're going to start talking about the Tower of Babel. We're talking here about a hundred so years after the flood, and um, I, I want to begin way back at the beginning. Last night I indicated you have to start at the beginning to understand the big story and the whole picture. So we're going back to the time before Abraham. And I just thought of something that I want to say before I talk about Abraham. Um, let me go back to my scripture here for a minute and take you to Genesis chapter 4. Um, just a second. I, I forgot just which verse that was. It just popped in my mind. And um, what did I do with it? <coughs> Some, somebody may have. Well, I'll find it. Yes, here it is in verse, um, chapter 4, verse 7. Last night I was talking about Cain, and I, I want to make a, a couple of important statements before we get to the Tower of Babel, because I hear all the time in, in my travels and in my seminar teaching that prior to the Mount Sinai experience, when God gave the Ten Commandments, that there was no law in those days. That before the law, there was no law. <laughs> I've heard that an awful lot. And that, that the whole idea behind this is that Christians like to find some way to justify lawlessness. And I wanted to take you back to when Cain killed Abel. Here we are in Genesis 4. And God said to Cain, after he said, uh, you know, he said, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? And if you do what is right, God said to Cain, if you do what is right, that Im implies that there's a wrong. The implication is there, although there is no text that says so. You know, the Bible operates on two levels. There are those who search it to defend what they want to believe. There are those who study it to see what it says. <laughs> Big difference. Big difference. Those who like to use proof texts use it to defend what they want to believe. They want one verse that says what they want to say. But those who study to see what it says want to look at the whole story to understand the way of God. There's a profound difference in our approach. God said, notice, notice carefully, this is God speaking. If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? Talking about his offering, you know, he brought fruit. But if you do not do what is right, what is the next word here? Well, what does the presence of sin require? Law. Because where there is no law, there is no sin. If there's no speed limit, you can't break the speed limit. God is speaking. Sin is crouching at your door, Cain. It desires to have you. But you must master it. Now, there was the knowledge of sin... There was the presence of law. There was the definition of right, all indicated in this verse. You just saw that. It's there, very clear. The reason I make this point is that I want you to understand that prior 2,000 years from the creation to Mount Sinai, approximately, that prior to Mount Sinai, the law of God and the laws of God were written in the hearts of the, of the people. 
They weren't written at that time on tablets of stone. They were written upon the hearts of the people. And the knowledge of God's law was conveyed from generation to generation. And at the end time, when we get to our part in our study of Revelation, I'm going to demonstrate from the scripture that a time is coming when God is again going to write his laws and his ways into minds and hearts of his people. Now you say, well, wait a minute, hasn't he already done that? When you're born again, doesn't he write his laws and his ways into our hearts? The answer to that is a partial yes. Let me go to the board here for a moment and explain something. When last night I used the illustration with the book, remember? So that when I gave my life to Christ, Jesus covered me with his righteousness, with his righteous life. And when the Father looks at me, he sees me justified, just as though I never sinned. Because he's looking at the righteousness of Christ that covers me. Right? Yeah. This process, in theological terms, is called imputed righteousness. The word imputed is a legal word that simply means to reckon as though it were. To, to actually um, look at Larry as though he were sinless, but in reality he isn't. The word imputed means to have that type of reckoning. It's like power of attorney in a, in a crude way. You have the right, when you have the power of attorney, to conduct business on behalf of someone else and sell their things or sign for them and so conduct their business even though you're not actually them. In other words, the law is imputing authority to you to do business on behalf of someone else. It's a well-known legal uh, expression and it's used by theologians because that's legally exactly what's happening. Larry is a sinner. He has violated the law, but... By accepting Christ and living by faith, the righteousness of Christ is imputed to him. And when the father looks at Larry, he sees him just as though he never sinned. And in the judgment, get this, get this, in the judgment of human beings, there's only one question asked. Is he covered with the righteousness of Christ or not? Can you think of any other reason to ask another question? <laughs> no. This is the only question. This is the only thing that matters. Now, the day is coming. The day is, and the time is coming. It's very soon. When the righteousness of Christ is going to be imparted. Revelation describes this experience in the most wonderful terms. Of course, other books of the Bible do too, but let me explain what this imparted means. We know what imputed is. Imparted. Let's talk about that for just a second. Then I'll go back to Genesis. Several things you need to kind of understand in the beginning to, uh, to, so that as you work your way through Genesis and uh, to Revelation, it all comes together in one harmonious whole. The Bible is really one harmonious story. When Adam and Eve were created, they were attracted naturally to righteousness. They had a propensity to righteousness. At the, when they were created, God put within them, this is a giant magnet having poles north and south. And I'm representing righteousness as the positive and sin as negative. And Adam and Eve were predisposed to be attracted toward right doing and righteousness. And for them to do evil was a real act of Congress. It wasn't normal. It wasn't natural. It wasn't easy. It was, it was something that really had to be done intentionally and defiantly. And that's what made the sin of Adam so grievous. He willfully and intentionally and defiantly took the fruit and ate it. He knew better. Now, Eve was deceived. Paul never forgave her for that either. <laughs> he 
as you read the book of Romans and others. Now, when Adam and Eve sinned, their predisposition or their nature changed. And they became attracted to wrongdoing. The propensity is to do evil. We all can thank Adam and Eve for passing along to us that experience, that curse, if you will. And so when a person becomes born again, God puts into that person a, an understanding and a love for right doing, but the nature itself is still carnal. When you read Romans 7, and I hope you have by now, you understand that Paul says, I know to do better, but I find myself not doing it. And the things I don't want to do, I find myself doing. He understood the struggle that went on. And we all discovered last night, everybody here also has the same understanding experientially. There were a few liars in the group, but other than that, <laughs> most everybody understood how it works. So when you become born again, understand the carnal nature is still there. Still there. And if we don't watch, it will rise up and bite us. Our humanness will come out, <laughs> as you've heard it said. How many times have you apologized and, and said to the one you've offended, I was wrong, my humanness overcame me, and I'm sorry. Oh, you've never apologized? <laughs> Understand something, that in a born-again state, this, there is a spiritual nature, there is a carnal nature, and the two war between each other, and Paul said, I die daily, meaning to his carnal side so that the Spirit may have dominion in my body. You understand this? This shouldn't be too hard to grasp. Now, when the righteousness of Christ is imparted during the 1260 days of the time period allocated to the two witnesses, the righteousness of Christ will no longer be imputed. The righteousness of Christ is going to be imparted, and what that means is that God is going to test every human being living upon the face of the earth. It's called the mark of the beast test to see who will live by faith. And those who will live by faith, once they've heard the gospel, once they've made a decision for it or against it, once they've been tested as to their determination as to whether they're going to remain true and loyal and stand firm in their faith, then God will seal them. And the sealing described in Revelation is the imparting of the righteousness of Christ where he removes He removes the propensity toward wrongdoing and puts us back in the condition that Adam and Eve originally had. This is how the saints, and I, this is so neat to me, get this, during the loud cry, during the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, during this time that is coming upon the earth, the most marvelous thing is going to happen. People who have never even heard of the name of Jesus, <coughs> There are more, there are almost, according to the American Bible Society, there are about four billion people on this planet who have never heard of the name of Jesus. Four billion. They say it's somewhere between 3.5 and 4 billion people never heard the name of Jesus. But the good news is this. During a relatively very short time period, God is going to send a, a whole... A wonderful series of events, a, a number of, of situations, if you will. And he's going to send this all over the world. Whoops. So that everybody, all six billion people living on the planet, 
will have an opportunity to hear the gospel. Jesus said, when this gospel of the kingdom has been preached into all the world, then what happens? Then the end comes. God's going to have 144,000 servants strategically placed all around the globe, and they will at the right time proclaim the gospel. And everyone will hear, everyone will consider, make a decision for it or against it. Everyone will be tested as to where they, where they stand. And after having been tested, individuals will either be sealed or marked. There's no in-between, sealed or marked. And the neat thing about this is that those who are sealed, God gives them the greatest gift that he could give man. He gives him a new nature. Let me show you this from the Bible, if you don't mind. I'm sure that's why you came. You wanted to see it from the Bible. <laughs> Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10. Excuse me, Hebrews chapter 8. I want to, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10. Notice what the Bible says. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. Covenant, that's a key word here, covenant. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer, notice this next verse. No longer will a man teach his neighbor, or a man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. No longer will there be evangelism. You know, in heaven, stand, there will be no doctors. There'll be no preachers. Same good. <laughs> Stan and I are going to get to enjoy fishing a long time. <laughs> Our work was be, will be over. <laughs> no longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me. Because from the least of them to the greatest, everyone will know me. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. And Paul says, by calling this covenant new, God has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and aging will soon disappear. See, Paul recognized this hadn't happened yet. The new covenant had not been implemented yet. He was waiting for it. He anticipated it. And he says, what is aging will soon disappear. The new is coming. And the new covenant is where God puts his laws into our minds and into our hearts. And once he does that, guess what? He has. He has children that are in full harmony with him. The problem today, in the current state, we can understand God's laws and something of his ways. We can love God's laws the psalmist says, I delight to, to do thy will. I delight to know thy law. I love the law of God. Because it represents the way of God. But we have the carnal nature that is in natural rebellion against God. It just comes with the baby. The warfare is going on. So, at the appointed time, during the time period of the Great Tribulation, God is going to impart his, the righteousness of Christ to every heart that is willing to live by faith. And then, get this, he's going to make it stick. He's going to seal them with this so it can't get away. Why do you put a seal on something? Is it not to secure it? Yes. This explains how there is a short period of time between the close of God's mercy 
and the second coming during which the seven last plagues are poured out. I want you to understand that the saints who have been sealed, received the imparted righteousness of Christ, will go through this time period committing no sin. And do you know why? They have no attraction for it. It's been taken away. Because by faith, God gave them, imparted to them, put within them, the very righteousness of Christ. I tell you what, that thrills my soul. God is going to do for me what I can't do for myself. You know, I told you last night, the short title for this series is called Jesus Saves. The reason that I have told you this before we got into the study is because one of the things promised to Abraham is the imparted righteousness of Christ. I'll show you that. That's why you want to be an heir of Abraham. Because this is what was promised to him. I'll show you. And the second thing that I want to show you, and I'm going to develop more tonight, and tomorrow night I'm going to develop this one more. But I'm going to, I'm going to show you that the other thing that was promised to Abraham is the land. The land. And when you have the land and you have the righteousness of Christ, you are prepared to enjoy eternity. So, let's go back now to Genesis 11 and I'd like to pick up with the something about, um, oh, I just remembered something else I need to tell you. <laughs> See, I'm, I'm, I'm revved up. I, I, you know, like I told you last <laughs> night, I read myself full, thought myself straight, prayed myself hot, and here I am letting myself go, and I'm just going off in every direction. <laughs> I, I want to show you something else. Let me take you to Genesis chapter 6, <coughs> verse 5. This is the time of the flood. The Lord saw, the Bible says, Genesis 6 verse 5, The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become. Hey, how can you have wickedness without the definition of law somewhere? You can't. Notice this verse closely. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become. And that every inclination propensity, inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. Sounds like today to me. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth and his heart was filled with pain. God understands pain. He was heart sick. Prior to Mount Sinai, the law of God had not been written out on tablets of stone because in the beginning God had written the law on the hearts of his children. And you know, when God has written his laws into the hearts of his children, they have an understanding of right and wrong that transcends what is written on paper. You know? Dave this morning spoke about selling cabbage in the United States. That the government regulations to sell cabbage, a head of cabbage, required some 29,000 words. Remember? The Gettysburg Address was a mere 280 something odd words. But to sell a head of cabbage, we have all these enormous laws and why, why, do, why do we keep creating laws? Can you give me one simple explanation why? Because of the nature of man. Because if you write a series of laws that leave any 
This is known as a loophole. Guess what will happen? In no time, the carnal nature will find it and psh, skedaddle. So what happens, and do you know currently tonight in the United States, resting upon every one of our shoulders here tonight are more than 24,000 laws. Someone calculated how many laws are resting upon us, ranging from selling cabbage to drinking water to traffic to property taxes to manufacturing thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of laws and every time they create a law the carnal nature starts looking for the loophole get out of underneath the obligation of law it's our in our nature it's our human and so Congress is trying to Ratchet it down, and it gets worse and worse and worse and worse. Well, the Lord saw how wicked it was. He was grieved. His heart was filled with pain. He saw the evil, and so the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I have created from the face of the earth. Who's taking responsibility for wiping mankind off the earth? Whom I have created. Men and animals and creatures that move along the ground and birds of the air, for I am grieved that I have made them. And you know, Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. The, the point I want to make here is that God reached a point up to here when he said, the land is so corrupt, the land is so defiled that I'm going to wash it and cleanse it with water. It's known as the great deluge. I'm leading up to something here. He cleansed it the first time with water. He will cleanse the land the second time with fire. I'm going to try to show you in the second half that the, God is very interested in the land. And he's not called the land Lord for just casual reasons. There's something very special here. So let's take a 10-minute intermission, and we'll be right back.